Our gospel reading this morning, Jesus reminds us in one foul swoop of his universal lordship, the church's universal mission, and his abiding presence. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, i.e. immersing people in Trinitarian reality. And two, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, i.e. guide people in Christocentric living. And behold, says Jesus, here's the great promise. I am with you always to the end of the age. At the heart of this great commission, Jesus makes his clearest statement about the Trinitarian life of God. Jesus says, baptizing in the name. Notice the definite article and the singular number, the name. And then he specifies three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Somehow, Jesus is saying, three persons simultaneously share one name. They are one name, one being. Every Jewish person of the first century would have known right away that the name was a uh, a reference to the singularity and, and the kind of absoluteness of the one God of Israel, Yahweh. That was his name, Yahweh. They would have thought of Exodus chapter 3, where Moses asks God when he's told, go tell the Israelites, uh, I'm going to redeem them. Moses says, well, what's your name? What am I going to tell them when they ask about your name? And God replies, I am who I am claim to just absolute unique singularity. And then he goes on and says, the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. And so that's why the Shema became the great creedal statement of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, Yahweh, our God, the Lord is one. The name of God, according to the witness of the Old Testament, speaks of the unrivaled uniqueness and singularity of his divine being. There is one God, and there is no other creator of heaven and earth. And yet, says Jesus, this one divine name is possessed simultaneously and eternally and equally by the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This one divine being, in this one divine being, there is a threefold personal distinction. Let me get a little technical. Three persons who are distinguished, not by their unique experiences or stories or personality types, but purely by their internal relationships to one another. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, but the Father has been begotten of no one. And both the Father and the Son are eternally united in the love of the Holy Spirit, who eternally proceeds from both the Father and the Son. In other words, for the God who is revealed to us in and by Jesus Christ to be, i.e. divine unity, and to be in relation, i.e. divine triunity, is equally constitutive of what it means for God to be God. This is the eternal life of God. He is not three, but he is one. And yet his unity is not monadic. It is a fullness of personal life and love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what we're talking about, based on the teaching of Jesus, is the mystery of God's inner life. And that is what Jesus wants people to be baptized into. That's the reality that Jesus wants people to experience. And so that's why this Trinity Sunday, we join with Christians around the world and throughout the ages to proclaim that God is not a problem to be solved. He is not a tool to be used. He is a mystery to be enjoyed and and adored. Now, in what I just said, it, it becomes abundantly clear that 
human thought and language are stretched to the breaking point in our attempts to adore who God has revealed himself to be. <laughs> uh, St. Augustine once said, when we think about God the Trinity, we are aware that our thoughts are quite inadequate to their object and incapable of grasping him as he fully is. And yet this didn't stop Augustine, and this didn't stop any of the great Christians of the past, and this shouldn't stop us from trying. <laughs> For the fullness of our happiness, says Augustine, beyond which there is none else, is this, to enjoy God the three, in whose image we are made. To enjoy God the three, in whose image we are made. Now it's worth pausing here for a moment. We're pausing here. Because when you're in the valley, you need vision. You need orienting vision. Vision of who God is and vision of what it means to be human, what human life is all about. When you're in the valley, you need to be reminded of vision. Because the ultimate goal of the church and, and the Christian life, according to Jesus, according to Paul, according to John, is not simply the preservation of bodily health and pleasure, although that's a great good. We believe in the resurrection of the body. Nor is it simply uh, to build a more just and equitable society, although that is a really, really great good. We believe in the new creation in which there will be no more lying, no more deceit, no more oppression, no more greed, no more racism. But the supreme good of the church and of the Christian life, the ultimate goal for which we should all be striving, is the vision of God, participation in the holy and mysterious life of the Trinity. We believe that the ultimate goal, as Revelation chapter 22 says, is that God will wipe away every tear from every eye, Revelation 21, and then we shall see him face to face, Revelation 22. And so I ask you, what does the world and our country need from the church in this moment of crisis? Well, many things. But one thing that's necessary is the reminder that human lives and hearts and minds and bodies and stories are a gift from God, sustained and cherished by God redeemed ultimately through God, and they reach their fullest potential and flourishing and happiness when they see God, when they enjoy God. And it's only when we're present to this reality, to this deep Trinitarian mystery, that I think we ultimately can find the resources we need to honor and cherish and understand and care for people as God made them. Contemplation of God energizes care for those who are made in his image. And I've been thinking about this a little bit lately. Like, it's so easy with all the different news headlines swirling and with all the, the pain and the brokenness and the voices that are crying out and, and the things that are going in our life, it's, it's hard to know what to do in the midst of all of it. And you, you can just be paralyzed by it in a sense. I think what God on Trinity Sunday is inviting us to is say, just hold on for a moment. Lift up your head. Remember who I am. with All of my majesty. Ground yourself in all the beauty of my love. Let your heart and mind and will and imagination be filled with the beauty of my life. And only when you're there will you truly be a retentive presence and voice in the world? In the midst of all that's going on, we best not forget God. <laughs> it seems that the Apostle Paul instinctively got this dynamic. Ending his emotionally charged letter to the Corinthians with a Trinitarian blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Paul, in concluding his letter to the Corinthians, asked God, the Holy Trinity, to give the Corinthians all the resources they will need to live out the gospel in their particular circumstances. And he begins with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace. 
receive the redemptive presence and sustaining power of Jesus. I think that's what Paul is saying. And Paul is particularly, I think, speaking this to people who are suffering, who, who maybe feel burdened beyond their strength, overwhelmed by the weight of sorrow, even maybe to the point of despairing of life itself. My grace is sufficient for you, Jesus said to Paul, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And now Paul is saying to these people, grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. It's one of those marvelous paradoxes of the gospel. No one likes to be weak. <laughs> no one likes to be weak. And no one likes to show weakness. And yet somehow it's when we are in that place, stripped of all the comforts of life as we once knew it, that Jesus comes to us and he ministers to us his grace and his redemptive presence and his sustaining power in the most intense and the most sweet and in the most poignant ways. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, says Paul. And then the love of God the Father. Receive the care and the compassion of God the Father, who cherishes the people he has made, regardless of what they can offer and what he can gain. This is a free and a lavish and an extravagant and a deep and an overflowing and an abundant love. And Paul is speaking of it, particularly those to those who need comfort. Paul mentions in his letter, People who are living in a culture that boast about outward appearances and not what is in the heart. And he, he mentions a culture where people are constantly comparing themselves to one another and vying for power. It's a competitive culture that breeds fear within and fighting without. And it's in that context that Jesus asks God the Father to pour out all the riches of his love upon his people. Because love casts out fear. Love undercuts the dynamics of domination with the power of service. Love gives without demanding anything in return. Love seeks the good and the flourishing of another person, even if it means laying down one's own privileges. This is how we know what love is, says John. That Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So receive the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive the love of the Father. And then receive the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The presence, the friendship, the companionship, and the solidarity of the Holy Spirit. Here, I think Paul, by using the word fellowship, is speaking particularly to those who are cultivating a culture of division and disharmony, especially in the church. More specifically, Paul mentions earlier in the letter the divisiveness that is called caused by those who align themselves with particular leaders and camps and then draw lines in the sand that those that align themselves with other leaders and camps. It's kind of like the ancient version, version of partisan politics. Paul specifically names this type of behavior. And then he names the sort of divisiveness that it so easily breeds in communities. He names quarreling and jealousy and anger and hostility and slander and gossip and conceit and disorder. Have you seen any of those lately? Paul says, receive, my brothers and sisters, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Receive the one who breaks down walls of hostility, who seeks to cultivate relationships. Receive the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel according to Paul. This is the Trinitarian reality that, that animated his life and ministry. And this, as we saw in the Great Commission, is the Trinitarian reality that Jesus wants every Christian to be animated by. This is what has sustained the church throughout all seasons and all generations and all circumstances. The grace of God, the love of God, and the fellowship of God. And so, Paul says in verse 5, 
Examine yourselves to see whether you are in this faith. Do not be consumed by the actions of other people so much that you forget to take an honest look at yourself, to examine your own life, to make sure that you are actually living in the Trinitarian reality of this grace and this love and this fellowship. And Paul says, if you are living in this reality and experiencing this reality, then it will be evident in the way that you relate to other people. He says in verses 11 and 12, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. In other words, Paul is saying, if your life is immersed in this Trinitarian reality, then your relationships will have the qualities of joy, restorative, comforting, uniting, peaceful, affectionate. And so, Holy Trinity, Holy Trinity Church, in this instance, I want to ask you a very practical question. Do your relationships display these qualities in this season? Do your hearts and your minds genuinely long for these things? Do your actions and your words bear witness to these realities? And let me get even more practical for a moment. Are these qualities reflected in the way that you are talking to one another and about one another on social media? See, one of the dangers of this pandemic season is that the, is the way that our image of other people can be distorted. We're not meeting with them physically, yet we're interacting with them on social media. And when social media becomes the only way in which we end up relating or talking to other people, we can have a distorted image of them. On the one hand, people tend to feel free to express themselves in ways that they would not in face-to-face -face conversations. <laughs> and on the other hand, their words are read and interpreted normally outside of the context of their living, breathing, day-to-day -day life. And so it creates this kind of virtual culture where the human person can sometimes be reduced to what they can say in 280 characters. And all too often, this virtual world often becomes an ideological battleground that can shame and blame and breed division among people. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, are we in the way that we speak to each other, even on social media, being an echo of this culture or a redeeming presence and voice within it? Is our speech restorative, comforting, uniting, peaceful, and affectionate? Because I suspect that the way that we speak to each other and toward each other in public is very important right now. doesn't mean that we don't talk about tough issues or, or the things that we vehemently disagree on, but it means that it matters how we talk and how we disagree. So I want to end by giving a few practical suggestions about what this looks like. I'm not prone to doing this sort of thing, but I feel the need to be able to do it in this moment. So five suggestions on navigating social media well. As someone who's not very competent in social media, <laughs> I'll admit. The first is listen well. Listen well. In other words, seek to give the most charitable interpretation of someone else's words as you can possibly imagine. And then try to understand not only what they are saying, but why they are saying it and the sorts of emotions and experiences that have shaped those words. Listen well. Number two, examine your instincts. Are we letting our level of education, the way we vote, or our ethnicity be the primary, note that word, the primary lens through which we view each other and treat each other? Even more, are we responding to one another out of a need to make our position look more credible or to prove another person wrong and undermine what they are saying? 
examine your instincts. Number three, write what you would say. Write what you would say. A good rule of thumb is unless you are willing to say to a person's face as the image of the Holy Trinity, what you are about to write on social media, then do not say it. <laughs> write what you would say. Number four, be a redemptive voice. Speak the truth without exaggeration and with grace, gentleness, self-control, patience, and humility. And seek to say things that build people up and don't tear them down. Be a redemptive voice. And fifth and finally, take a break. <laughs> Pay attention to your heart. If you find yourself becoming angry or bitter or resentful or hostile or cynical or sinister or sharp or agitated or under restrained in your speech, then maybe you should consider just taking a little break from social media. It's not going to kill you. Take a break. See, I think that the way in the midst of so much social distancing, which I am longing for us to meet together, but I think the way that we speak to each other, even in the virtual world, is meant to be a reflection of the way that we relate to one another and treat to one another when we are physically gathered. And that is meant to be a reflection of the way that Jesus relates to us and speaks to us. And that is meant to be a reflection of the way that the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit relate to one another and speak to one another. So my dear brothers and sisters, I want to end by reading a couple stanzas from a prayer. It's a liturgy for before consuming media. And it's written by Douglas McKelvey. And you've heard me quote him so many times, but I just cannot resist. So I'll end with this final prayer. O oh, discerning spirit, O oh, discerning spirit, who alone judges all things rightly, now be present in my mind and active in my imagination as I prepare to engage with the claims and questions of diverse cultures incarnated in the stories of diverse people. May the stories I partake of and the way in which I engage them make me in the end a more empathetic Christ bearer, more compassionate, more aware of my own brokenness and need for grace, and better able to understand the hopes and fears and failures of my fellow humans, so that I might more authentically live and learn and love among them unto the end that all of our many stories might be more beautifully woven into your own greater story. Brothers and sisters, that's my prayer for us this week, that all of our many stories might be woven in our words and in our actions into God's own greater story. So I speak these things to you this Trinity Sunday in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.